started with our first presentation. So, Rado Kara has been heavily involved with notebook development the past several months, and uh, he'll talk about it. I think his repository is sort of it. Him and Jason are the best places to go to get the latest developments. And I suggested that he lead off with a state of the notebook address. Let us all know where things are and get good. <coughs> All right. Uh, even though the title is State of the Notebook Address, that doesn't mean I'm the president of the notebook. <laughs> <laughs> Rob's idea. Everybody can contribute to the notebook. So. All right. Uh, so, it's, uh, first of all, it's, uh, if you have any questions uh, during the talk, just feel free to ask. It's not supposed to be. Just presentation and get turned into question and answer session. All right, so just uh, I was trying to define what is the Sage notebook. Not that everybody here knows what it is, but uh, just trying to put a, a definition or a mission statement to the notebook. And that's what I came up with. You might have your own, but uh, so I, I like to think of it as a web app for document editing that supports collaboration, multiple users, uh, administration of the users, and one of the extra features is execution of code. So, and this code doesn't, you know, it can be Sage, of course, but it can be, it's very easy to execute code in different environments. So uh, that's why if you look at this, it started from a Sage project, but it, it really, you can think of the Sage notebook as, uh, you can think of it as a kind of different project and that's why William uh, I think two years ago spent a lot of time separating it from Sage project and that's why it gets its own uh, development now on Google code and so on. So it's, uh, it, it's it's something that started from Sage but you really can, can be built as independent. So here's the history of it. Uh, originally developed by William, Alex Kronesha and Tom Budby and uh, so only William is here now. And this is just a little bit about the decision to go with a web application instead of Google application, which is a little bit unorthodox. It, it, especially in 2006, it was very unorthodox. Nowadays, it seems that uh, things are, it was the right decision for things of interest in it. And uh, William's reasons, number one, uh, GUI applications are hard to write, hard to build, not portable. And uh, number two, you get bad experience with uh, with uh, Maximus GUI. And uh, this is the the key is with web application, so much comes for free. And that's that's uh, something that's something that I think we all can attest to. Okay, so the terminology when we're working with the application, the notebook. So again, most of you might know is somebody who's new to this. Uh, the notebook is what we call the server, the web app. The worksheet is the document file. And for each worksheet, when you're running it, there's one Sage session in a separate process. And the cell is a single block for execution that uh, you can just execute this code in cell. So uh, if you're coming from Mathematica, it's a little bit flipped in Mathematica, where Mathematica notebook is what we call worksheets. So. so why choose the notebook? Well, you get all these things that come for free. Once you're in the browser, once you're in the HTML environment, you get the tiny MCE. Uh, that is for that's what we use for editing, right? So this text right now in the notebook, here it is now I can edit it, right? So has everybody seen that? But uh, it was very useful. So again, this is something that we just had to hook up. We didn't have to write this editing environment. jQuery UI is what we use for sliders for the interacts. JMO for 3D, JS Math uh, for Pretty, pretty uh, LaTeX environment. And again, those are things that were written 
not specifically for this project, and we could take it, take it just because we're using uh, using the notebook as a web as a web app. All right. So here's the interacts. As an example. The zoom might be too big. Let's see. <coughs> this is running on a network. So. Alright, so this is an interact showing. Oh, SVD composition and compression using that. So if you increase the singular values, that's really small. See the building. Okay. I recognize the building. I should choose with this one. <laughs> yeah. If I got the right picture, I'm not so the Alright. So again, so what um what is this is the this is what we call the interact and the sliders and uh, these elements they're part of jQuery UI. So again, jQuery is a big uh, JavaScript library used almost everywhere in the web, and we can use all these tools in the notebook. That's uh, that's nice because. Uh, Developing, especially cross-browser compatibility issues, pop up everywhere. Being able to use all these libraries is nice because they, they take care of that. And, uh, okay. uh, this is another thing that we can use in the notebook. This is this is how I got into notebook development. Uh, it's my contribution. Uh, this is a graph editor, so. This is using a canvas element so you can create the graph on the fly and then uh, immediately get it back into Sage to do serious computations with it. How big can those graphs get? Uh, well, it, <laughs> it can, I think right now browsers are fast enough that uh, the graph can be as, you know, it can be bigger than you can nicely represent. So uh, it, it can be very big, except you wouldn't be able to see anything meaningful out of it. So the, the limits are your visual perceptions because you imagine thousands of nodes. Yeah, and there are, and there aren't tools to scale automatically. No, 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 no. I haven't had zoom, zoom out. No, no. I, it's it's built from basically from scratch. So there's a canvas element which uh, modern browsers support, which you can draw on it just like uh, it just provides primitives, and then from there on you write your visual app basically. So uh, so yeah, actually being on this, I can make a plug since I do it. this is the new version. How it's going to look like? It's not in Sage yet. Uh, Right, so it has this live interaction. Mm -hmm. um, the old one has that, but it's much worse. So this is smoother and uh, new things. Is now you, you're going to have uh, information about edges, information about vertices, and uh, you can add your own labels, tweak it, and so on. Yeah, so this will be in stage soon. And again, uh, it's using the canvas. The help menu, I'm using jQuery UI. So again, it, it's, it's very nice to develop this because somebody else made it. I just have to call it jQuery UI. So, um, any questions? And if, if, you know, if, if I had to write this uh, for a regular application, it might be a little bit more painful. Because uh, then I have to worry about you know then you know now the, the browser for example is taking care of the different operation systems you might be running this on. Uh, if you try to write it from scratch, you have to take care of it. So is that purely available in the notebook? Exactly, yes. Notebook. It's only in the notebook because uh, <laughs> I have to rewrite it, but it's it's running it's JavaScript, right? So uh, you can just put the JavaScript on a static web page. Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course, but. You still have to open the browser. Right. Right. Yeah. So I guess you, yeah you can you, you it's not right now it's not made so but theoretically you can make it from so that uh, on the console you open you make a static web page and you open the browser on it. So that but then uh, going back to 
then going back to Sage. No, I wasn't thinking of that part, but just the, the, the graphics part. Oh, no, I mean, it's... You want to stay at the low mode, but you right, yeah. me, can you put it in web work? Uh, that's what I'm heading for. <laughs> 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 it looks like something that the people at the Northern, Northern Arizona University would like to have. I think that's one version of it, but this is much nicer. You can use no five seven. Who at Northern? Who at NAU? Vandor, uh, Siemens. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm developing it as a standalone library, right? and it can be used for anything. Okay, so it's, it's a web widget. That's what. Right. right. So that's that's what I was asking. But yeah. yeah, being in the notebook means you can get all these web widgets in there and use them for anything. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, somebody asked me if I, they can use the graph editor from console, it's tougher. <laughs> Some, you know, some sage users might prefer to use the you know, command line, but you, you're missing out. Right, no, 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 no. Is yeah, is <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Let's not get perverse. Okay, so there's basic code editing. I didn't know about this, uh, but it's there. I didn't know until a few months ago. So uh, these little text cells, they are more advanced than just text cells. Uh, if you do control zero, it closes. It closes the brackets uh, automatically. So again, uh, it, this is uh, something named Tom would be added. That's part of the the JavaScript. It comes with Sage. And, and, also, the, and also, if you highlight some block and hit tab, it indents the entire block, mm -hmm. and then shift tab unindents it. One other code editing thing you really want for Python. Yeah, no, it, it's, uh, it, it is it is a it is a programming environment. So it, it's a little bit more work to make it really make it really nice, but uh, it's it's there. The, the the capabilities of their JavaScript is powerful enough uh, to be able to do things like this with it. All right, you can do. So this is just little tricks. I, I haven't thought of a really nice thing to do with them, but uh, you know, you can in, put your own HTTP. In your little, you can put your own uh, styles. So you can combine presentation with computation. So if you're, you know, if you're presenting this to somebody, you can you can add some more presentation elements in it. Do all the JavaScript tricks, you know, like the alerts. Is that new? Huh? No, it's not new. Yes. I mean, it's just just the fact that you're putting in, uh, just the fact that you're getting HTML back, you can add anything HTML, you know, any JavaScript, you can add it there. So you can you can make these widgets on the fly, and uh, yeah. jQuery UI is there, so. Uh, I do this, you can pop it out. <laughs> so, 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 again, that was just calling the jQuery that comes with, with uh, the Sage one book. So, again, those, those elements are there. You can, you can really get creative. You can put them together and make your computation you know, pop out. So, put something on top of it, some representation of it. So, you can make widgets. And a lot of math objects you can imagine. Here the math object. Here's the math object that's pure data, but maybe I want to present it in a different way. And uh, on the notebook you can do that better than just text, which what you what you you'll get. Yeah. All right, uh, we can get audio now. <laughs> so now modern browsers have audio tags, video tags. So you, I guess the possibilities are there. Uh, why become a notebook developer? So I feel that I wanted to add this because uh, a lot of math people, you know, if you come to developing Sage, you want to develop algorithms. If you develop for the notebook, there aren't any algorithms really to do it there. There isn't uh, there isn't the glory of implementing the hardest math object, but. Uh, any improvement you make on a notebook, you're guaranteed to be used of, to be used by lots of people, by basically almost everybody, except the people who use only the command line. So your code will matter more in a way if you develop for the notebook. It's uh, 
it's a cool way to learn about modern web technologies because we really use the modern web technologies. We're constantly updating uh, with the newest things that come out. We're going to get Ajax soon. Get, uh, there is a, available there. Uh, it's, it's a great way to develop collaborational tools. So if you're passionate about this, you can fix the bugs that nag you about Notebook and uh, you can make profit. There's, I think, the, the first Sage bounty the first amount of money that's been offered for new improvement to Sage has come for the notebook to get a new Interact. I think it's still open, right, Jason? I haven't heard anything about it being withdrawn, so... Uh, and, and you haven't heard about anybody working on it either. So. I haven't heard anybody working on it. So yeah, the, the bounty has been offered for uh, a new type of... Uh, so we have this Interact, we have sliders, right? So Mathematica has an Interact which gives you a 2D field where you can move a point around and you can use this point as a computation. So the bounty has been offered to implement this in Sage. Yeah, I believe it's up to 80 pounds of Amazon books. Yeah, oh yeah, it's only Amazon books. Whatever you want on Amazon, actually, I guess. So if you're hungry, you should But uh, I, I think it's, it's representative that the first bounty came for the notebook. It didn't come for, you know, nobody offered $100 for the fastest uh, new algorithm. It came for usability. So, if you want to start developing for Sage, the notebook is a good place to start. All right, so now I'm going to talk more about the technology behind the notebook. Uh, any questions so far? And you said Control Zero closes the reference? Yeah. Which browser is it? It's a third one. And Control Dot is supposed to comment and uncomment? Yeah, that doesn't work in Chrome. Does it work? Right. I thought it was control three. Some, sometimes control zero resets your zoom. Yeah. I think it's yeah. control. The, the thing is, if the browser, yeah, if the browser captures that yeah. combination for something, it's for it's all documented. If you for the browser, then you wouldn't yeah, be able to yeah. use it. So. And if it doesn't work, file mode. Has, has there been any uh, well, the any talk page. of getting syntax highlighting? Uh, what you say? There's going to be attempts. I asked for that. So it's no I think for it, I, think oh. I want to make one comment. So a few days ago, one of the final projects in my Sage class uh, by a couple of students was integrating Tiny MCE and CodeMirror into the notebook cells. And they made a demo and they posted a patch. And it's on the 480 website for my course. So instead and of the, writing, <coughs> yeah. So instead of writing here, you're writing Tiny MCE. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So basically, it's always oh, tiny MCE, nice. but you have one mode which is code, which uses code mirror, and the other mode which is the usual WYSIWYG tiny MCE. Uh -huh. And the students that did it were pretty good. One of them's, um, I think, working at, I don't know, I think he's working at Facebook all summer or somewhere. I mean, he does a really good job for the summer doing web programming. Can so. you convince him to work on this? He's on the, in the class. No, he chose the project himself. But he, he did a nice demo during class. A uh, few. This was literally a few days ago. So, is, is it easier to get code mirror with with Tiny MC, or do you get the benefit from that, or or is well, that just, just getting code mirror seems, on this? I think it's um, as you seem to realize. It seems a little weird that we have you know a text editor, and then you have these weird tiny MCs that pop up right between. And yeah. why are there two different things at all? It should just be cleanly integrated. And code mirror means you automatically get syntax highlighting. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's good or not, but it's worth taking a look at if you want to work on this sort of improvement. So, it felt a little slower, but he was demoing it in class on his red and laptop, which, you know, I think I have 50 of them. Though. So, yeah. well, but then the question is, is so when it's using Code Mirror, it's actually going out to Code Mirror? They, there's a, I th it's not the Code Mirror, the website. Code is a, no, Code Mirror is a JavaScript. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, JavaScript yeah. Code Mirror. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. something different. Yeah. I'm see, aware of some website that's a Code Mirror. Okay. Yeah, code, code Mirror is yeah, it's like a code editor that can edit several different languages. I think he wrote it, He also wrote a um, Code Mirror extension for Cython, so that it could highlight Cython code. Admit that. So, yeah. So, yeah, his name's Alex. If it slows it down, you put an on off Alex button. Alex yeah. It's Alex Harwin. R is his project for my 480 plus. So I'll put a link to it on the CHDS 31 site. All right, so now about the technology behind all this. So it's a web app. Uh, it was written originally using Twisted Web 2. And uh, all the data is 
in memory used in Python classes, and all the persistency is uh, using file system data store. So everything is written to the files on the hard drive, whatever you want to store. So uh, not 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 too typical. That's that's not a typical way to do a web app these days. So that's why um, that's why William was talking about using database. So anyways, uh, we, uh, Twisted Web Two is has been deprecated and uh, it's gone to the point where if you go to their website and you look for what is Twisted, if you go should I use Twisted Web Two? They answer what is that? So. Even the authors don't want to admit they wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that that was the status. And actually, right now, if you get Sage from, you know, whatever it's, uh, you go to download Sage. That's what you're gonna get. It's gonna get the Twisted Web 2 version. And what what happened in January 11? Uh, Mike Hansen there uh, and me. Uh, we started rewriting the, the web app away from Twisted Web 2 into uh, this micro framework called Flask, which is a Python micro framework. And, uh, right, so Twisted is still in uh, Twisted is still used, but now it's only used as a as a web server providing the WSGI. So WSGI is just an interface coming from Python. Uh, to communicate between the server, abstract away the server and the web app. So you can have one application that just serves and one application that uh, does the logic that you write. And um, I think Jason he has instructions how to run the Flask, the Flask uh, web app with uh, NGINX and uh, this uh, micro WSGI extension, and theoretically you should be able to do it with Apache and most WSGI, but I don't think anybody got around to really test that. Is that something that you or someone else is interested in this week? Getting it with Apache and, well, there's so many things. Flask.sageandv.org runs with Apache plus mod WSGI. Oh, okay. Oh, so, never mind it. Yeah, we did it, remember we did it last time at the end yeah, of the Sage days. I, 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 thought we were, uh, I thought we went over Jason's instructions for uh, NGINX. Uh, it's Apache. I'm not running an Nginx. Uh, okay, so, so I guess we... So that does work. I don't know. Okay, so you, aren't, you haven't completely removed the Twisted web server. No, if you end. use this, it's not oh, using Twisted. It, uh, if you use Apache and... It is using Twisted. Isn't it using Twisted for the... See, this is what I'm confused by. I think it is using uh, Twisted. So there no, is no, it's not using Twisted. Well, there's a couple of things. Um, so the Flask notebook is not in Sage itself now, so if you download Sage, right. you get it. Um, basically, it uses Twisted Web 2 when you get a URL. Well, yeah, well, Twisted Web 2 is the thing that's handled yeah. like the dispatching to all like, the correct function. Um, so um, this Flask notebook completely does away with Twisted Web 2 okay. and uses Flask. Um, but if you use this, the Flask version within Sage, um, Twisted, like just another thing it has is a um, WSGI, a Whiskey server. And so um, if you use this in Sage and you're not deploying it with like a patch in your Nginx or something like that, then um, by default it will call it the Twisted web server. And that will know, just, you know, take the request for it along the class. And, and, and. Yeah, I'm wrong. That's currently what's happening with Fasta, So Twisted gets used a little tiny bit, as mentioned by Mike just now. So, but there, so there's no Apache? But if we, if we run it Well, it's still Apache, but it's just so crossing. Can we, yeah. It's so Apache is pressing the Twisted? Yeah. Uh, so, so the Flask doesn't, the problem is the Flask doesn't serve WSGI. Is that yeah. the issue? No. Wait. But, uh, it can in the bug mode only, but oh, uh, yeah. The it, the reason why we use the Twisted Web Server is that it um, supports like SSL, uh -huh. um, whereas the sort of you know demo like base HTTP server that comes with Flask you know, doesn't implement that sort of stuff. Well, if you're gonna put it through Apache, is there any reason? 
to worry about that. Just do the secure serving on Apache. That also speeds things up because Apache's got very efficient SSL stuff. Right. So you run Sage behind Apache. Yeah, this is the twist of web server is just so a user can type in notebook and not have to set up Apache and then still get SSL. Yeah, we mean my interest is bigger scale. Like uh -huh. We're talking about for hosting hundreds of people. Right. We'll put in work to get it running with our own current Apache server with proper SSL certificates. Right. So what we want to do is make it. So one one thing we want to do is make it so you can deploy it with like uh, Apache Smog with mm -hmm. um, and then have you know the. Uh, so that so one reason why we can't do that now is that there is still a, like in memory single pin representing the notebook, and so so I guess you could do something where you could make it. Um, you could force it to be multi-threaded, but not multi-processed, um, because you can't have these two sort of single pin objects living in memory. So, what we, so one of the goals for this week is to sort of get rid of that, push it into um, a database, like basically anything you need into a database, and then when you serve it, um, you can uh, you can have like multiple processes, multiple threads. And it's all just talk to the database for the two. And then for things executing, if you want to add more um, servers to sort of do computations for people, those would also talk to the database and get their Q report from there and get the results in there. Um, so, so one of the goals of this week is removing sort of shared state from the notebook, pushing that into a database. And once you have that, um, then it's easier to scale. So. Continuing exactly where Mike left off. Uh, so what happened is, once we got to Flask, we could run it multi-threaded. Uh, but that's just an intermediate. So we do need, right now, so how it was written originally, it was written to be run as a one, just one thread, and uh, all the state had to, is there in this Python object. So uh, what happened is, in March, uh, what we, we figure out is that uh, we can run the Flask multi-thread if we put enough logs. So we need the logs, we need to put those logs because uh, otherwise, of course, you can either don't thread safe regions. But uh, what is good is if you think about how it works is most users will really be working on a different worksheet. So uh, the, lo we, the, the logs uh, that we added are, we added per worksheet log for worksheet uh, for uh, for uh, worksheet operations, and then one global log for the big operations, which change the whole state of the notebook, because there will be there will be requests which only change the worksheet state, and then uh, you don't want to lock everybody else on that. So that's that's what is there right now, and again, this is forced by the fact that originally was written to be using the to be using uh, to be run as a one process and uh, using the data the the hard disk. As data storage. So, if we move into a database, the database should take care of that, and we can really run it multi-threaded and uh, not worry about locking because that's something that we guess the database should take care of. Just, anyways, uh, so the current status is uh, used to be used to be more things here, but I think we basically ironed out all the little annoying bugs that came with this rewrite. And right now we just need to package it better and make the setup scripts. And to, uh, one of the goals I think should be that uh, we should push this uh, for the next to be part of the next stage because there is already a little bit of improvement. So here's the stress testing. I did well. so. You can see uh, I, I used something. <coughs> first thing I found I guess uh, called. Um, Grinder, just an application for stress testing written in Java, so it can really go through, you know, uh, it can mult mult use uh, multiple threads to hit your application. So this is something I test on a server we have in uh, in uh, Singapore. So like four four CPU server, um, 
12 gigs of RAM, I think. From the, so if you have 50 threads, uh, what you should be looking at, okay, so what you should be looking is, uh, I made, I, uh, automatically the, the test goes through four steps. It makes a new cell, puts something in the new cell, hits shift enter basically, pulls this cell until it gets evaluated. The computation is small enough that it gets evaluated immediately, so the first time it pulls, it gets back the answer, and then deletes the cell. So the mean for each one of those operations was uh, half a second, and this is when I'm running 50 threads. So uh, still not that great, but I think it's better than what we had before. I guess I didn't do the previous version, but uh, so it, it does half a second when you have, so that's like 50 simultaneous undergrads just hitting shift and enter nonstop. <laughs> And it takes half a second for each one of those. So all together, all together, it will take uh, two seconds. Uh, I, I guess I don't know. It, it's hard to test those things because you don't know what the typical usage is. But uh, this is what uh, uh, this is what you expect to be the most common use. So then, uh, if you do hundred, it basically goes linearly. If you do hundred, each operation now takes one second, one point two. And then if you do 200 threads, it takes 2.3, 2.4 seconds. So that, that's pretty bad. But uh, again, it's 200 simultaneous users. So to go through the whole thing, you take you wait eight seconds to create a cell case shift and then come back. And uh, but again, it's 200. I think currently the the old version would cannot can go anywhere near 200. Yeah, but have you done any stress testing of, of this type with the current notebook? I did, but I forgot. I did. Because I, I just as a uh, <coughs> plug for making this get in as soon as possible, uh, I ran a workshop on Friday where Sage looked incredibly unprofessional because everybody was trying to log into one server. How, and, how many uh, people? Well, I had done it with 15, and it took people about five minutes to kind of get in a year and a half ago. And this time there were 24. And it's like a stop function, you know. It, it doesn't it doesn't kind of slowly degrade. It's just all of a sudden nobody could do anything. So I sent someone to Flask and someone to one of so the other server. We we have already set up. Uh, Which we already March. know the twenty is kind of the upper limit, but it was interesting uh -huh. to see just how bad it was. Yeah, no, I mean uh, when I did uh, we did a testing last March, but I didn't keep the numbers. I mean I might have them somewhere, but okay, here. Uh, it was yeah, it was already obviously much better with the Flask version uh, exactly. in March. And that's why we set up flask.sagemb.org. Right, right, right. So if anybody wants to get scared. Which is what I should have done is sent them there. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, was, it was something like twice as, twice as good, like it, it yeah. allowed twice as many simultaneous. Yeah. But we, did, we didn't do like 200, so. Right, okay. Yeah, whatever we did. Yeah, it, it was, it, it's, it was it's at least better. twice as good. Uh, <coughs> there, there's no reason for keeping the old one, I guess. Right now. So we have to. And this is all are the 200 threads are in the same worksheet or 200 different words? Uh So what I did is I ran it, uh, I first of all, I turned off authentication so you can go to any worksheet. I set up 100 worksheets, I think, and I made each thread pick a random number from 1 to 100 and go to that. Yeah. So exactly. I want it, It's a realistic scenario that everybody works on their own worksheet. Because 100 people work on the same worksheet. That's. Yeah. No, no. I used to, but you say randomly, so there's a size of the number of people that use the same word. So the size of the number of threads. Yeah, in this I case. I just want yeah. to know how much. Yeah, in this case, probably. Yeah, probably. How much, what's the, how much is spent in locking? How much is just the CPU so, on the server? Another project. I have the, if anybody, I have the setup for this testing utility, and I think it's pretty good. Uh, it has a console, it has workers that attach to this console. So I, I you know, I, I, I figured out how to use it, just the basic, but uh, we can <coughs> we can very easily make 1,000 worksheets and run 100 threads on 1,000 worksheets and then make sure that, it, or, or make everybody go to their own worksheet all the time. And uh, that's that. So we, we can see if there's a difference for that. But, but, yeah, I don't have the numbers right now. So yeah, the way it was done is there was 100 worksheets and everyone's going to a random one. All right, so. Now a little more about actually, if you want to start working on it today, what do you need to know? Uh, you need to know, just to describe Flask as any other modern web app, it uses the MVC, uh, the MVC pattern. So there's a model, 
view and controller, right? So a controller is where the URLs come, the controller figures out, depending on the URL, how to dispatch to some function. So that function, that Python function, is going to fill out a template. So that will be the view, and it will fill out a template with some information from the model, which the controller will get and pass to the template. So, any questions about this issue? Most people should see. This, this is not something I made for Sage, so we don't have MySQL. That's the, that's the problem, right? We, we, our models right now, they're all in-memory Python objects. And uh, that's fine, that's fast, but when you want to write, you're bound by the right. All the writing is done on the hard disk, so it's that it's all I/O bound. Uh, all right. So how does this map to the current code? So if you go and pull the the repository, so right now, uh, so let me show the repository. So we're using Mike and I used. Uh, Google code in January when we started rewriting in Flask and it worked pretty well for us. So I just kept using uh, Google code for this. So I don't know if, I guess, everybody has to decide what to use. Uh, but uh, the idea of Google code is everybody has their own uh, clone, their own fork. You just work, you push, you work locally, you push to the Google code. And then other people can pull from there, and then things get merged, and uh, eventually somebody will push to the big main repository. So right now, if you want to get it, uh, you want to get what I have currently, which I try to integrate all the other improvements by, made by other people. Uh, you need to go to SageMB, and then uh, this, it will be arcuro flask Okay, so this this is the and uh, if you go to the okay so Google code slash r slash arcuro dash class I have instructions how to install it on Linux and Mac uh, and then you're ready to start playing around with the current version. Is it is that the same if we're going to actually be trying to modify it? Yeah. You do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, you what you do is you create a clone yeah. on Google code and then you right. push to your own clone from your local. Okay. And then when you have something that is reasonable, you can tell some of us and we can pull from there. And then everything will bubble up to one. I don't, I don't know, it's, I think if, I would discuss this with the other people, but it worked for Mike and I uh, in general. So I think it's a reasonable model instead of throwing out patches to track. Okay, so, all right, so if you get that, what you're going to get is uh, a folder called Flask version. So there is all the new Flask code, which was pulled out from the old Twisted Web 2. And uh, it's... Okay, so this is how it looks like. Uh, so this is Flask. So what Flask does is uh, you take this, this is the controller, it takes the URL, it maps it to this Python function, and then it uh, executes the Python function. So this is for the static stuff, the static stuff is pretty simple. different methods and so this is all the new flask stuff and then whatever we needed this g dot notebook this is this big in memory notebook state which is the same as what was before so now this was the new stuff but it was it was rewriting only this communication this only this controller part and from there on all the models and everything was the old stuff so that's why so I managed to finish it uh, pretty fast and uh, it, it didn't rewrite the whole thing right, so if you want to go from there on now this notebook it's in a so it's starting from the same uh, directory sagemb slash notebook this is where the old notebook is which has all the 
the actual notebook information, and then you have things like notebook, users.py, and so on. So those are these Python objects which have all the methods to do the internal logic of the web app. So when I say execute this cell, right? When the URL execute this cell comes in, it goes through the flask, which I showed you. It's, it goes through this, and then from there on it calls the right notebook dot whatever, the right notebook object, the right worksheet object. And uh, so then you go to Sage and B notebook. So now this is this is completely independent of the web framework. Now here on they're just Python objects which know what to do with if they have the right methods to implement the logic of the web. Okay? okay. And then you have Sage and of storage. This is this there's actually it's, it's written like it should be easily extendable, but I don't know how easy it is to extend it. It has abstract storage and implementation through a file system. That's that's how when you you know when the notebook object here says save the state. It goes through the file system storage and does the right thing on the file system. And it does it with certain, so every software. So that's what, that's what translates the in-memory to what's on disk. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, so that's the part that's going to get <coughs> that's adjusted to be to it. So this is a slow, this is, this is what slows down everything. To do the database. Yeah, this has to be a database. Because, uh, it's like, it's trying to solve a problem that's been solved. But, uh, database is should be. I mean, well, this is a way of doing the web apps. Right? Since you're doing this in Python, what about a Zip database? <laughs> which was the back end for Plone, and they've got that working pretty quick, pretty fast now. Because <laughs> it's already, oh, it's already I Python so. huh? I wouldn't use so again. <laughs> again, you're in trouble with it? I've used this several times, but I definitely really wouldn't choose that now. I mean, I would use I would use either. I don't know. I think the best thing to do is to make something that works well is SQLite because SQLite also seems to be used pretty widely and is very fast. I mean, fast it, it is for, used very heavily. It's just that you've already got the Python objects, and so open yeah. database basically is a bunch of Python objects, isn't it? No, some other actually, ORM. it isn't. There's, there's I don't think engine ORM that we could use. Yeah, I, I, I think we should support both SQLite and something else, like SQLite and Mongo. At the very minimum. And when you support SQLite, you're supporting MySQL potentially as well. You could support SQL Alchemy, which is maybe SQL and PostgreSQL and MySQL and Postgresql. Have you used PostgreSQL? Yeah, Tech Track is running up. Mike said Track up on PostgreSQL. I mean, as a backend, for the station, but. No. No, we haven't used it yet, no. But I think at a bare minimum, we absolutely have to support SQLite because that's the one high performance yeah. database that's actually included in Sage. And Python, yeah. And I mean, and it's Python after that. by default, yeah. So. But, but so it raises an important question about whether you want to be interacting at the SQL level or whether you want to be interacting at a library level using an ORM like SQL Alchemy or SOAP or Django or whatever else. I guess one approach was writing basically our own ORM. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, well, <laughs> easy. well, the thing is, is that we know exactly what we want to store in the database. We know exactly what we want to get out. So just making an API for the database. It, it also makes it possible to support both something like MongoDB and a relational database like yeah, SQLite. Totally different. Which yeah. have, yeah, which um, ORMs like SQL Alchemy don't allow you to do. They don't allow you to support two very different no SQL, like SQL and no SQL databases. Yeah, yeah. The reason why we went with Flask instead of Django is less heavy. Because of what? Less heavy. Le mm -hmm. Less heavy ORM stuff. Or yeah, like, but at a, from a different perspective, like for, so I'm someone who's big into Django, so I'm biased in that direction. <laughs> but, right. you know, it provides you with some great tools for managing the, the objects stored in your database. And it's got a great layer of user permissions and groups and user management and group management. To me, though it's not core to what Sage is or what Sage Notebook is, and lots of people have done that, and you know, Django provides one way of connecting users, groups, permissions, operations, in a generic 
manageable way, both at the coding level and at the operational administration level, to the content that you've actually got. And if you're dealing with thousands of users and tens of thousands of worksheets, why, why try and re-implement it? Like Flask is great for spinning up some quick stuff, and but you know when you get beyond having a class of people on a single server and 50 users, then I think you kind of potentially think about what what are the core goals. I mean, I use Django for a lot of different uh, projects, um, but I mean, I guess, well, I guess when I decided to go with Blast is, mainly our, our first purpose was to rip out Quiz uh, Web 2, uh, and, and do that and not move everything over to a database. One time, since that would, well, not as good as good of a chance of getting done. Um, to go, you know, if we did decide, like, Django makes sense for handling, like, you know, using their permissions and that sort of thing, the amount of work it would take to switch the like, class you know, like, over to Django is, you know, not much. I mean, because just have to change some of the routing, but um, just still feel very similar. So I think, um, I mean, mainly it's deciding what you want to use for, to store the data. Like, do you want to use James or do you want to use uh, that? The other thing, well, the other thing is all of our templates are in Jinja 2. So, it's sometimes annoying if you have um, Django templates and Jinja 2 templates, since they're very similar, but there are things that are... I just different. use Django with Jinja 2 templates. Like, yeah. yeah they're Maybe. inspired by Django templates, and Django templates are kind of crap, which is why right. Jinja exists. Right. And have you used something like pop? Like, like pop in to, like in a, in a, to get Make Jinja 2. So you can use, like, for example, all of the admin templates with Django, but um, rendered by Jinja 2. Um, have you? I don't, it I don't know. I've, I've mixed Cheetah and, and Django templates before, but I've never mixed other things. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's, it's not a lot of work. I mean, mm -hmm. it's more work than doing Flask based stuff, but. Yeah. So. So yeah, I mean, it chose Flask because it was um, sort of lightweight at the time. It or, it already used Jinja, so it just you know basically it didn't have any change on that end, um, and we didn't we hadn't decided on how we were going to store the data eventually. So so I think it's you know something to look at um, and like, discuss what sort of our needs are. It's still, I mean, right now, right now the Flask works, but now from here on, yes, we, can, we can discuss more. We've, once we start doing this database storage, uh, it's, it's still, I, mean, I don't think anybody has actually started working on this database storage. So, you can decide where to get there. Okay, and then another thing, if you want to be modifying the templates, because, you know, some people just want a small, Modification to the notebook, but it seems a little daunting at first. There's so many pieces. Uh, you can go straight to sage lb slash data, sage slash js or slash slash html. That's where the templates are. So the, there's a lot of work that I mean, templates can be vastly improved too. So you can uh, go and uh, start some hacking at this. So this is where all the static storage is at. Yeah. So now I can ask my question from earlier today about the uh, folder uh, in the Sage Devel Sage Sage uh, server, and there's all kinds of stuff in there, including notebook folder. And is any of that still necessary? So Sage Devel yeah, Devel Sage Sage server. And Just Sage Main. Yeah, sure. 
that is something called that's, server. That's necessary for exactly one reason, which is migrating existing notebook installs that used Sage prior to version four, I think, or something. Okay. That's so, the only reason. Wait, it, so the so the whole server because there's also stuff for track and wiki, or is it just the notebook folder inside the server folder? That's I'm only talking about the notebook folder. The notebook in there. folder. Yeah. Okay. You I I think it would be good to delete that soon. Maybe because in stage five. It's been over a year, and we have a one-year deprecation policy. And if you really need to migrate a notebook server that you have from yeah. a long time ago, yeah. just use any version of Sage up 3.0.